The following video contains major spoilers for Brothers A Tale of Two Sons. For those who haven't finished the story and don't want anything to be spoiled, I'd advise turning off this video for now. For those who don't know what Brothers is, it's an adventure platformer that depends heavily on the narrative to tell one of the most beautiful and emotional stories in gaming. If you haven't played it, I highly recommend trying it out before proceeding any further. It's really the kind of thing that everyone should experience without prior knowledge going into it. But I won't waste any more of your time for those who don't care about spoilers one way or another. So you have until the end of this sentence to click off this video and avoid any spoilers. You have been warned. What's happening, guys and girls? Akronator here, and welcome to another episode of Paradoxical Ramblings. Today, I'd like to talk about a topic that caught my attention recently while making my way through the leveling zones in the Broken Isles. What is it that makes a good hero, specifically a good stoic hero? First, I should probably explain what I mean by stoic. It's kind of a vague term often used to describe characters that are anything but relatable. What I'm referring to are characters that have gone through hell and back and managed to smile at the end of it. Not necessarily tragic heroes, but perhaps those who've experienced loss. While some heroes are destined to go out in a blaze of glory, others have to stay behind and pick up the pieces. The end doesn't always come with the death of a significant character, and sometimes the story progresses much further beyond their sacrifice. What I'd like to focus on are those that manage to rise up from the ashes and succeed despite the pain they've endured. There are plenty examples out there of characters who are placed in horrible circumstances, but not all of them mean much to the player. Why is that, and what is it that makes us feel so sympathetic to these characters' plights? Is it just our own dispositions to favor certain characters over others? Maybe, but I believe the world building also plays a key role in evoking emotions. To better understand what makes a quality character, let's look at a few examples. In the platforming adventure title, Brothers A Tale of Two Sons, the older brother is the more reliable of the two main protagonists. He's more physically capable than his younger brother, and is shown from early on to have a stronger moral compass. We're given an emphasis on the fact that he is the driving force that's pushing the dynamic duo forward. The reality of the elder brother's significance becomes all too apparent when the younger sibling's fragility is brought into account. In fact, even before the older brother is introduced, we're given an explanation as to what physical and emotional hurdles the younger brother has stumbled across. In the opening scene of Brothers, a short cinematic sets the tone for the rest of the game. The younger brother is aboard a small rowboat leaning to one side, yelling in an intelligible language, and is panicking. It's only then do we realize that the boy's mother has fallen out of the boat and is drowning. She can't swim, and from the looks of it, neither can the boy. He's forced to watch his own mother sink into the murky depths, being so close, yet so far. The cutscene subsides and the game opens up to the younger brother on top of a hill, standing next to a tombstone overlooking the very waterway he just lost his mother to. From here on out is where the player seizes control of the siblings in order to search out a magical tree in hopes of finding a cure for their father's sudden illness. You make your way through the mountains and various platforming puzzles in the process. You come face to face with trolls in a mineshaft, witness the aftermath of a war between giants, and fight off a shape-shifting spider witch. It's after this final boss battle that the game cements its story forever in my memory. Just when you've plucked out the last of the spider's legs and it's left squirming on the ground, it deals a deadly blow to the older brother, square in his chest. He's bleeding profusely, and it's now up to the younger brother to show his strength in getting the party the rest of the way to their destination. The one minor solace to the dire situation is that the spider's lair was right next to the tree that you've been searching for. You help the older brother hobble to the base of the tree, where he tells you to go on ahead without him. He says to get what they came for and meet him back there when you're done. You can tell that the younger brother doesn't want to leave him alone, but at this point, he doesn't have any other choice. You climb your way up the tree and gather the mystical water that you need. The entire trip feels eerily solemn. The music goes faint, the color palette of the scenery becomes dulled, and everything goes a bit too smoothly. You make your way back down the way you came, and you find the older brother dead where you left him. In the back of your mind, you probably knew this was a possibility, but you just didn't want to believe it. You don't want to acknowledge that such a sacrifice can be made so late in the game, when everything was finally taking a turn for the better. It's a heartbreaking moment, but the hardships aren't over yet. Not only do you have to see a character that you spent the last few hours of gameplay with die, not only do you have to watch your character come to the realization that his older brother isn't waking up, but you have to bury him yourself. This is what's so memorable about this game, and it's why Brothers will forever be ingrained in my head. The agonizingly slow movements coupled with the constant sobbing and the impact of what you have to do is just unbearable. When the deed is done, and you hitch a ride back to the cliff from where you started this whole adventure, you have to make your way back to the father, alone. 
These are trials that you required both brothers to complete just a short while ago, and ones that the younger brother must now face alone. The final test is to swim across a stretch of water without anyone's help. This is something that would have been impossible before, but you've grown much from your journey, and it's either face your fears now, or run from them forever. Needless to say, you conquer your doubts and swim, and ultimately save the father. The final cutscene that ends out the game is of the father standing beneath the new tombstone for the older brother, located right next to the mother's, crying for his lost son. Standing right next to the father, comforting him, is the younger brother. For everything he's been through, and for how immature he acted in the beginning of the game, he's grown into a compassionate person who others can rely on through whatever hardship. It's this character development that makes the younger brother a great example of a stoic hero. He's gone through so much pain and has managed to persevere in spite of it all. The grief alone would be enough to break the wheels of grown men, and yet he's a better person for it. Another hero for which you may be more familiar with is Alex Straza from the Warcraft universe. I'd hope that the majority of you who've played World of Warcraft would know this character, but for those of you who don't, Alex Straza is the Red Dragon Aspect, also known as the Life Binder, and is the Queen of the Dragons. Her, along with the other four original aspects, fought and killed the progenitor of dragonkind, Galakrond. From there, the titan keeper Tyr and a few of his fellow keepers empowered the aspects with various blessings. Alexstrasza was given the blessing of Eonar, the titan who saw after all life in the cosmos. As a result, she could feel for all living things on Azeroth like no one else, a setup all too perfect for someone who would suffer more than anyone. I'll do my best to organize the major tragedies in chronological order, but we're still going to be here for a while. During the War of the Ancients, the dragons were forced to deal with the aspect of Earth, Neltharion's betrayal. With his new moniker, Deathwing wreaked havoc on anything standing in his way of global conquest. He even fooled his fellow aspects into giving a part of themselves to the demon soul. You may be wondering why this is so significant for Alexstrasza's suffering in particular. Sure, she had to deal with her fellow aspect going haywire and decimating the dragon's forces, but that affected all dragons, not just her. Well, the thing is, Neltharion and Alexstrasza Straza were very close before the madness claimed him. They were both just about equals in power and size, and had a healthy respect for one another. Their friendship grew out of a willingness to work together towards the betterment of Azeroth. What's more is that Alex Straza retained her sanity throughout all of this, while the blue dragon aspect Malagos arguably suffered more, watching the majority of his brood die to the power of the demon soul, he sort of lost it afterwards. He was undoubtedly in pain for the 10,000 years leading up to present day, but it's almost incomprehensible to say what he actually felt due to his partial insanity. Sanity. Fast forward about 10,000 years to the Second War, and Alex Strazo's resolve would be put to the ultimate test. The orcs had hit a brick wall against the newly formed alliance, and they were desperately turning to any tactics they could get their hands on. The warlock Necro Skullcrusher managed to get a hold of the Demon Soul, and eventually figured out how to use it. He incapacitated the Red Dragons, and used their eggs as hostages in leverage against the Dragon Queen. Alex Strazo was chained up against her will, and forced to provide young dragons for the Horde to use as mounts against the Alliance forces. If she refused to cooperate with her captors, they would destroy her eggs. She watched throughout most of the Second War as her children were enslaved as weapons of death and destruction, only to be slain when they grew too much to be handled by the orcs. In the novel Day of the Dragon, we get to see a bit of Alexstrasza's thoughts about her whole captive situation. While she loathes the Horde for what they've done to her children, she never loses hope that one day her kind will be set free. When the time finally came and the Red Dragon Coriolstris orchestrated the rescue of his queen, the first thing she does is take vengeance on Necro Skullcrusher. Alexstrasza then takes her brood to go assist the Alliance in their fight against the orcs. The Battle of Grimbatal was just unfolding to a climax when the dragons arrived, and it appeared as though the Alliance was going to claim a decisive victory, that is, until Deathwing reappeared. The corrupted aspect of the Earth attempted to finish off Alexstrasza and reclaim his dragon soul, but the Dragon Queen's prime consort, who had been captured along with her, fought back. Tyrannistraz charged Deathwing in order to buy the Alliance and the dragons more time. The fight was vicious, albeit short, and Tyrannistraz fell, though not before inflicting a decent amount of damage to Deathwing. But wait, there's more. Hell, we're hardly halfway through the major struggles Alex Straza has gone through. During the time of World of Warcraft, the Nilla Raiders came across what is probably one of the most infamous bosses in the game's history. Nicknamed the Guild Killer, Vale Straza was one of the first few bosses in Blackwing Lair, as well as Alex Straza's son. Vale, as he's commonly referred to as, tracked down Nefarian and helped out in defeating the remainder of the orcs serving the Black Dragon within Blackrock Spire. Eventually, the Draconic Lord of the Upper Mountain gets fed up with your meddling and takes Vale hostage for his experiments. You don't see him again until he shows up as Vale Estraz the Corrupt in the raid, where you unfortunately have to put an end to his misery. In Wrath of the Lich King, we see a lot more of the dragons, Alex Straza included, meaning that we get to learn a lot more about the newer members of their race. One such dragon we get to work with while questing in Koldara, off the northwestern coast of the Brian Tundra, is Carrie Straza, Alex Straza's daughter. 
She helps us take out some of Malagos' forces during the Nexus War, where the crazed blue dragon aspect is trying to hoard all the world's magic for his kind only. One of the final tasks you're given is to take out Malagos' prime consort, Saragossa, in order to prevent the blue dragon's forces from growing any larger. In retaliation to this act of defiance, Malagos swoops down and captures Karistraza as his new consort. The aspect of magic brands her body with runes and uses powerful spells to twist her mind, until she finally went insane. We're later sent into the Nexus dungeon to put carry Straza out of her misery, and she even begs us to do so throughout the fight. When taking out Malagos in the Eye of Eternity raid later on in Wrath, Alex Straza still feels some level of remorse over killing her former brother in arms, but you know she's gotta be hurting inside over the loss of her daughter. Just like her brother before her, Carrie Straza's demise was not pretty. Around the time when Deathwing caused the Shattering, Alexstrasza's most recent prime consort, Coriolstras, had traveled underneath the Wimmer's Temple to the Chamber of the Aspects. There he discovered that all of the eggs had been replaced by those of the Chromatic Dragons, and that this was all part of Deathwing's scheme to destroy the other dragon flights from within their temple. Coriolstras had some of the eggs' taint spread on him after coming into contact with one of the hatched shells. He knew that he could not allow this plan to come to fruition, and sacrificed himself in a magical explosion that consumed the whole of the chamber. For a short while immediately after his sacrifice, most everybody thought that Crassus had been working for Deathwing in order to cripple their forces. Only later did Thrall share a vision of what truly happened, clearing Coriolstris' name of any wrongdoings. I mentioned this a bit before when discussing the battle for Grimbatal in the Day of the Dragon, but Coriolstres, or Crassus for short, was one of Alexstrasza's favorite consorts. Of course she loved all living things, her own flight especially, but Crassus held a very special place in her heart. If you read through various novels in the Warcraft universe, you'll find that Crassus appears in many of them, and the Dragon Queen is of the utmost importance to him. For Alexstrasza, losing someone as close to her as Coriolstras, as well as going through the roller coaster of emotions of first believing that he was a traitor, only to later find out that he did not in fact betray anyone was almost too much to handle. This story is told in much more detail in the novel Thrall, Twilight of the Aspects, and it describes Alexstrasza as letting out an anguished roar over her lost love when seeing Thrall's vision. Some of the recent events that have taken place in Val Shura are what I believe may be the biggest blow to Alexstrasza yet. Anyone who's been keeping up with the questing in Legion can probably guess where this is going. Ysera fell at the hands of Xavius, and then us adventurers had to finish her off. This is a tragedy so significant in the lore that we got to see one of the most dramatic interventions by the goddess Elune in Warcraft history. While the Dragon Queen has lost much up until this point, the one person she's always had, even from the beginning, was her dear little sister. They were together when they finished off Galakrond, while fighting off the original demon invasion during the War of the Ancients, and when Deathwing was silenced for good. One common point of confusion with the dragon aspects is that they often refer to each other in the lore as brother and sister, even though Alexstrasza and Ysera were the only true siblings. The others were really just called such as a sign of eternal camaraderie. We haven't seen how this loss has affected Alexstrasza, but I can imagine she's feeling very alone right now. The only notable close relative left to her is Marithra, Ysera's daughter. Technically, Marithra was last seen trapped within the walls of Ankiraj alongside Kaelastrasza, and Aragos. Though, it's worth noting that both Kale and Aragos have been known to escape the Kiraji city around the time that the AQ raids were defeated by us players, so it's not that far-fetched to say that Marithra has also since regained her freedom. So why have I been wasting all this time telling you these sob stories? It's not necessarily the struggles that make the aforementioned characters special. Other characters have easily suffered just as much, if not more, compared to Alexstrasza or the younger brother. My point here isn't to measure who can garner the most pity. I think Isaac from The Binding of Isaac would definitely be up there if this were the case. The reason I exclude Isaac from the classification of being a stoic hero is because that he does the exact opposite of what our other examples do. He runs away and hides from his problems instead of facing them headlong. Isaac's story is a bit vague, and I'm not taking into account any of the fan theories, but he rarely gets a happy ending. The closest we get to happy endings are for 15 and 17, which both depict Isaac running away from his mother. He might be able to survive in these outcomes, but he never stood up to his homicidal mother. In most of the other endings you can unlock, Isaac either dies or embraces the darkness that his mother tried so desperately to purge from him. You may argue that Isaac becomes powerful enough to fight back against his mother as he progresses through the various levels, but I see it differently. Isaac isn't fighting against everything that the antagonistic force in this case his mother, stands for, but rather embracing it. Just take a look at some of the most powerful items and transformations in the game. They utilize either the holy power that Isaac's mother fanatically worships, or the satanic power she tries to destroy, basically meaning Isaac either conforms to his assailants, or he becomes the monster they claim him to be. 
Now, I'm not trying to badmouth Isaac. I'm just pointing out that he hasn't done much to persevere through these hardships. This is exactly why I hold characters like the younger brother and Alex Straza in such high regard. They've been through hell and back, and have managed to not only survive, but return stronger. There's definitely something to be said about watching heroes withstand every hurdle life throws at them. No matter how unfair, how heartbreaking, or how devastatingly evil these experiences might be, they survive, and that's something worthy of respect. Well, I hope you all enjoyed this episode. It took quite a while to write out the script for this, but I'm pretty happy with it. If you did enjoy it, feel free to give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see more like it, maybe even subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. Links for my social media and whatnot are in the description below. And as for the comment question, what's your favorite hero from any story that went through immense hardships? They don't necessarily have to be from a video game. I already talked for quite a bit about my favorites, but I'm curious to hear about yours. Anyways, that's all the time I've got for today. So until next time, don't die.